In the second video for 4.1, our learning objectives are going to be predict the solubility of compounds in polar or nonpolar solvents and understand how polar and nonpolar molecules can in actual fact be mixed. This is going to link directly to firstly this science understanding where we're going to be able to predict given the structural formula uh, which two compounds would be more soluble in polar and nonpolar solvents. We can think of solubility following this general principle of light dissolves light. What that means is that nonpolar solvents tend to dissolve nonpolar solutes, and that's because they have the ability to form sufficient dispersion forces that exist between the solute and the solvent particles. And this will allow the solute particles to essentially separate from one another and then be surrounded by your solvent. Polar solvents, on the other hand, tend to dissolve polar solutes. So in this case, we form dipole-dipole interactions and hydrogen bonding between solute and solvent particles. And again, this will allow the solute particles to become separated and then surrounded by the solvent. We can see this idea of like dissolves like when comparing a range of alcohols. We have a list of alcohols here increasing in size, going from methanol down to heptane 1 -ol. And all of these are primary alcohols with the OH group on the first carbon. If we have a look at comparing their size, based on their molar mass, we can see that it does actually increase. So methanol at 32.042, going down to heptan 1 ol at 116.198. How, how does this actually affect the solubility? Let's have a look. So what we can see in this case is that solubility generally decreases from top to bottom. Methanol, ethanol, and propane 1 ol are alcohols which are completely miscible in water. That means we can add essentially any mass or volume of these alcohols to water and it will form a miscible layer. As we go down, we can see that the solubility starts to decrease. So butane 1 ol at 7.3 grams per 100 mils of water. After that point, it will start to form uh, two miscible layers. If you go down eventually to heptane 1 ol or anything beyond that, then these alcohols are essentially completely immiscible. So no matter what volume you add, it will always form two separate layers. We say that N-butanol, which is the same as butane one ol is a partially miscible liquid. So if we imagine that we've got 100 mils of water here, then it turns out only 9 mils of butane one ol can mix with water and be completely miscible, that is to form a single layer. If we were to add a bit more butane one ol and by a bit, I mean quite a lot more. Uh, what we can see is that it starts to form two immiscible layers. That's not to say that there isn't any uh, butane one ol that can dissolve in water, because in both cases, what we can see is that in this case, there's about a 50-50 ratio of water to butane one ol, whereas in this bottom layer, we've actually got predominantly water, about 98% water to about 2% of your alcohol. These are classified as immiscible layers because they have distinct chemical compositions. They differ in the concentration of the alcohol in the water itself. We can also look at solubility of vitamins, and we know that we can classify vitamins as either water-soluble or fat or lipid-soluble. So vitamins like your vitamin Bs and Cs are classified as water-soluble, whereas your vitamin A, D, E, and K are considered your fat or lipid soluble. Why is that the case? Well, we know that water itself is a polar solvent, so in order for something to dissolve, it itself would uh, generally need to be considered polar. Vitamin C, which is also called ascorbic acid, we can see it contains many of these OH groups, and we classify them as polar OH groups or polar hydroxyl groups. On the other hand, vitamin A, if we have a look, it only has one of these polar OH groups, and then the majority of the molecule itself is just made up of carbons and hydrogens. So we can call it a hydrocarbon component, and this section itself makes a majority of the molecule itself nonpolar. So for something nonpolar like fats and lipids, these can act as uh, nonpolar solvents and help dissolve our uh, fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A. Based on the two previous examples, we can come up with a general rule where as the size of a molecule increases, 
we can say its solubility in water generally decreases. And this is due to two fundamental reasons. The molecules generally themselves become increasingly more nonpolar as the size of the molecule increases, the size of this nonpolar component increases. And this makes it increasingly difficult for water to then separate and surround the molecules. Because keep in mind, water is a polar solvent, so it likes to interact with the polar uh, solutes or other polar components. This is our next science understanding. Compounds with nonpolar and polar or ionic components facilitate the mixing of polar and nonpolar substances. There are numerous mixtures that we see around us and they consist of both polar and nonpolar molecules. Some examples are things like paints and cosmetic creams, uh, milk, mayonnaise and salad dressings represent different food mixtures. To allow for these polar and nonpolar components to mix, we can look at incorporating a separate molecule that is made up of both of these different components. And this should help facilitate the mixing process. What we get is the polar component of our molecule interacting with polar molecules. Our nonpolar component will interact with nonpolar molecules or solutes. We can look at mayonnaise as an example. We know it's mostly composed of vinegar and oil. Vinegar consists uh, of two main ingredients, which is polar water and ethanolic acid molecules, and we can see this down here. Oils, on the other hand, are generally classified as non-polar molecules. So this represents a triglyceride, which is an example of a type of oil. We can see that this large section here, which is made up of only carbons and hydrogens, is classified as a non-polar component. Um, so overall, this molecule is non-polar. To allow for the vinegar and the oil to mix, we look at adding egg yolks uh, as an emulsifier. Egg yolks contain this ingredient called lecithin that is made up of both polar and non-polar components. In red underneath here, we can see that this is a polar component and it actually is what we call an ionic component because it's made up of this uh, nitrogen group which is positively charged. We've got a phosphate group here with a negative charge as well. The green and the red components are nonpolar components. You can see it's predominantly made up of just carbons and hydrogens, making these nonpolar components. The purpose of an emulsifier is essentially to act as a bridge that allows both polar and nonpolar components to mix with one another without separating. Soaps and detergents are other compounds that can facilitate with mixing. They are commonly referred to as surfactants, which are cleaning agents. And in particular, what they can do is help remove non-polar fats and oils uh, or grease from surfaces. We know that water is a polar solvent, so it can normally remove polar stains quite well. But things like oil, which is non-polar, uh, it can't remove very well. Soaps and detergents are going to help form this bridge between the water and these molecules themselves. We've got some examples here. We've got a soap anion here and underneath we've got a detergent anion. What we can see is that both are made up of similar components. Uh, in red, we have what we call this hydrocarbon tail, which is made up of only carbons and hydrogens. And then in blue, we have what we call an ionic head. So that is a small section that contains a negative charge here. The red component, the hydrocarbon tail, is going to overall be nonpolar, and because of that, it's going to be what we call hydrophobic or water fearing, whereas the blue component, which is the ionic head, is charged and it is water loving or hydrophilic. So it's going to want to interact with water. So how can we actually get this to remove non-polar stains like oil and grease and um, fats from our pots and pans or even from our clothes? The soaps and detergents themselves encourage the formation of structures called micelles. What we have is some type of grease or oil or fat in the middle, which is a non-polar stain. Each of these represents our particular surfactant. It's got its uh, ionic head on one end, and it's got its hydrocarbon tail down the other end. What happens is that these hydrocarbon tails, which are non-polar, like to interact with the nonpolar grease or oil. So they will all point inwards. The ionic heads will all point outwards. 
And because they are negatively charged, they can interact and form quite strong interactions with water. We call these interactions ion dipole attractions because they are between an ion and a dipole or a polar molecule. This entire structure is what we call a micelle. And what we see is that these micelles are extremely negative structures because they have all these negative charges on the outside. This is another example of the micelle. We can see it has more of a three-dimensional structure. So you've got all these negatively charged ionic heads around the outside, the nonpolar hydrocarbon tails all pointing inside and forming strong interactions with the nonpolar grease. The water will interact with those negative charges and it's these negative charges that can actually help keep these micelles in solution and stop them from settling and precipitating out onto different surfaces. So these uh, stains themselves can often be removed uh, with the addition of our detergent or soap. That concludes our work on 4.1. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.